Hello. Hi. How are we doing? You... Hello. <laughs> Hi. It's me. So... What a turn up. I was I was talking to Roshana, ironically. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're here. You came. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's okay. We had a power cut, so the internet was off as well. So I've had to try and work out. <laughs> <laughs> and where are we at? What are we going to do then? What's the plot? Um, are we live now talking to people? or what, where, where are we with this? Uh, am I being recorded? Uh, where, where, where are we at? Yeah, yeah, we are being recorded um, here and we're also live on YouTube. So Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Okay, well, hello world and welcome. <laughs> yeah. So you just so... to carry on then, do you? <laughs> <laughs> so welcome... Welcome to the show, and Thank you. we're down to our last. Actually, you're the last speaker for our last day of our expo. Okay. So okay, let me. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So our speaker. Let me introduce you first. Okay. Our speaker is a highly professional public speaker and after dinner speaker, delivering moving eulogies and funny wedding speeches, as well as being a master of ceremonies, adding style to any occasion. He's currently embarking on a, on a tour of the UK as a motivational speaker, helping people to boost their confidence, earning power, and contribution to their communities. I am pleased to present Adrian Dotti. Adrian. Well, what can I say after an introduction <laughs> like that? I, is that me you're talking about? <laughs> I thought I'd better turn... To, yeah. It's um it's great to be here. We've done something similar earlier in the year, so I don't even know if I've got the same audience or not. So I'm going to try and mix and match it a little bit. Um, I've uh, been blessed in life to have a great journey, an exciting journey. Um, they talk about planning your life, and I think that for me, it's really about opportunities and waiting for them to come along. And if if you feel that uh, it's got you written on it or you get that little tummy little moment in time or that maybe your hair stands up on your on your um on your arms then i think that you should follow your gut reaction i mean after all we all come out the cave many many years ago before all this wonderful technology such as zoom that we're talking about now and i think sometimes we forget to do that i think sometimes we we get too caught up in the technical things that we forget to listen to to us and um so I think that the first thing that you'll do when you feel you get that little spiritual idea is that it, the first thing you're likely to do is to speak to somebody about it and go, I've got a great idea. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do whatever it is. And, um, I suppose like a lot of things, the thing that brings me here today is that the conversations that I'm sharing with you, um, and people like me that have done lots of different things. And I don't know where you're watching in the world or where, what age you are or whether you're at the beginning of your career, whether you've just retired and you're looking for something to do or whether you've just started your career and um, maybe, you, maybe you chose a career and maybe, maybe you found that you didn't actually enjoy it as much as you did and you're looking to do something different. So this is a mixture of sort of pitfalls to avoid, uh, what to do when you've got a belief and, and you want to carry on with it and you're not quite sure whether to listen to some of the doubting Thomases, because obviously you don't want to take, not take any advice at all. Why would you listen to me, for example? By the same token, some things like a wheel, they don't necessarily mean need reinventing. Obviously we've seen things like Uber come along and disrupt markets and go on to greatness. But they didn't actually reinvent the wheel, did they? They just took the wheel and, and just sort of twisted it a little bit and changed it a little bit and decorated it a little bit and made it a little bit more accessible and got the price, the USP a little bit and off they went. So sometimes it's something like that. But other times it might be something ridiculous. So I'm just going to throw a few of the things that I didn't do to show you that if you don't do something, you might be sitting there like me and going, why didn't I do that? And they're not big things. They're not big things. But we live in a big world. So a little idea and something really simple would um, could could cost you dearly in terms of success and could leave you a little bit frustrated if you if you didn't um, if you didn't pick up and do it and and one of the things was uh, a silly little thing is uh, hoovering i don't know how many of you like hoovering um, hoovers have got pretty pretty clever over the last few years but i'm going back probably 25 30 years 
And I can remember hoovering and thinking to myself, why is it whenever you hoover, there's always a horrible smell comes out the hoover? You know, maybe you're hoovering. Um, not that I've been a great pet lover, but if you're hoovering for someone that's got pets and you've got dogs and things like that, you get the horrible sort of doggy smell or whatever it is. Or, or maybe you're in a in a, in a, in a community, in a, you know, a commercial venue where you know there's there's things been spilled on floors and things like that. All these horrible smells. And I thought to myself, they ought to have a a nice little smelly to put in the hoover so it smells nice. And what I actually did was I got hold of, um, you don't see a lot of them now, but you know, maybe you go to a toilet and you, you'll see they'll put a smelly in the toilet now. Well, they, they, they were invented. So I got one of those and I put it in the hoover. So sort of moving forward, I, I, hoovering was a little bit more of a pleasant experience. But you know what? 25 years later, you go now into a supermarket and you can now actually buy a little smelly just to go in the hoover. So there's one idea that was a, a seed and I let it go and didn't do anything about it. The other one, once again, I'm going back, oh, I don't know, 22 years at least. And as has already been discussed, uh, you know, I, I'm in the entertainment industry of, of one of my little journeys. And therefore we're away from home and all the rest of it. And, and in the early days of mobile phones, the batteries were a little bit to be desired and the, the ability to st stop the car and plug in or to get charged and everything was pretty thin on the ground. So I thought to myself, this is ridiculous. It's only a battery in this phone. Why haven't we got another battery that we can plug into this phone so that we can charge the phone on the go? What was the matter with me? Why did I not follow up on such a simple idea? And ironically, and I didn't even know I was going to mention this today, but there you go. There's the little thing there at the pound shop now. But you, know, you can buy different uh, examples of it. If you haven't seen one of these or what, know what I'm talking about, I don't know where you are in the world. But we, we, over here, I'm in the UK talking to you guys. And, um, and obviously, we've got the little um, where you would put the charger for your phone. And then you've got a little USB where you charge up the battery here for a rainy day. So there's just two examples of where... There was a business opportunity, a good business opportunity. Neither of those things that I've just mentioned took what might be described as a phenomenal amount of investment to uh, to design, to um, you know, you know, to manufacture. I mean, fairly simple. You know, um, I did take one of these apart because of my conversation, and basically, all that's in there is an AA battery. The fact that it's got some little connections on the outside, and um, you know for um the different countries that specialize in making electronics probably one of the easiest things that you'd ever ask them to make but but i didn't do it so there you go so there's my little you know i'm not here talking down to you i'm just merely sharing information if you're just starting out or you have an idea that sometimes you know if it was good enough to come into your mind it's good enough to explore so don't let it go even if it's something really simple like a little smelly to go in the in the hoover so there you go um the other thing is uh, sometimes everyone talks about, you know, we're going to make loads of money and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And we're going to, you know, I want to be a millionaire. I want to be a billionaire. I want to do this. But you know what? Sometimes life isn't just about the money. And you'll find when you talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, business people, past and present, that actually they do actually enjoy the game more than they do the actual money. Obviously, the money is important and you need the money to live and and of course, it does make it. I uh, think I saw some quote the other day. You know, it's, uh, money's not everything, but it makes it makes it a little bit more comfortable, or something like that. But so there's some things I've done in my life where, once again, that whole kind of sort of spiritual sixth sense, call it what you will. You know, the hairs on your arm go up when you either hear some music or you see a particular thing, and um, and you think to yourself, that's something I would like to do. Now, for me. And, and I should point out before I go any further, before I start on this bit of this story, is I'd never, I'd never, I'd never sung in the bath really, let alone been a singer. But during the entertainment journey, um, a friend of mine asked me to uh, help him with a, a group called, um, well, two two guys who were very famous, and um, they were called Flanagan and Allen. Now they were obviously back in the forties, so a lot of people on here probably weren't even born then, nor not need not even me. Twenty years before I come along, but. The point is they filled the London Palladium in London. Once again, that is a big, famous theatre where uh, people that 
want to be good at tennis play at Wimbledon. People that want to play snooker play at the Exagon. And people that are entertainers want to do Sunday night at the London Palladium. So they filled the London Palladium every day, every day, except Sunday, for 10 years. So that'll give you some idea what these guys were about. They were like called the crazy gang and they were like the modern day comedians of the day. And this guy that I was uh, had asked me to work with him wanted to um, start to um, wanted to do like a kind of a tribute to them, and he picked me to be uh, Alan out of the two. And I said to him, "Well, thanks for the invitation." I said, "But you know, I can't sing." No, no, no. He said, "Of course you can. Of course you can." I said, "No, I, I can't sing." He said, "Yes, you can." He said, "It's only Run Rabbit Run." He said, "Everybody can sing that." I said, "Yeah, but I don't sing." Anyway, cut a long story short, he got me started. And and we did do that to fruition, and, and then it was it was reasonably successful. But you see, that brings me on to the next part of making a choice to do something, because what happened next was I don't even know where I got it from, but it was a CD, and it was CD of um, Frank Sinatra. Once again, if anybody doesn't know who Frank Sinatra, he, he's a, he's an American. Uh, very successful singer once again from the sort of 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. I think he died around about late 79, 81, something around that. Um, but um, there's no way if you live on this planet, you don't listen to some of his music or songs on a daily basis through some advert or, or something. And um, he um, had, uh, like a lot of the entertainment industry, um, was uh, sort of born in well, he came, born in New York, and he came across the Jersey River, and he lived in uh, in New York. So he had worked there a lot. So because he'd grown up there, he'd had association with the, with the American mafia, and um, therefore they they prevented him from from working there. So anyway, that, that went on for a while until eventually they did let him work there. So to cut a long story short, this CD was him performing in Madison Square Gardens, 20,000 people, a 42 piece orchestra, and coming on to a four minute introduction by a guy called Harrod Goes Down. Now you, you can Google this after the, after the uh, event. But for me, I just happened to put that on. I, I'm, I think I was in the car and it came on and as this 42 piece up was just sort of started up and as the bass drums kicked in, something happened to me. It was just magnificent. And for some bizarre reason in my head, and remember I'm someone that didn't even sing in the bath, I decided that I had to live that experience. So I set about working out how I was gonna do that. So I got a big company uh, that was happy to sponsor an event and we had a thousand people hundred pound free course meal and we uh, admittedly it wasn't a 42 piece but we hired a 70 piece orchestra and I had the same intro and came on to in this instance ladies the tramp and you know um, I was looking at it the other day on a bit of footage and um, there's a little experience of where once again you have the concept of something that's a burning desire that you want to do and there's ways of doing it now once again these things won't happen easily. And when you set out, although I recommend following your dream and, and doing these things, don't do it blindly because I can assure you, if everyone was gonna do it, it would be easy. But these things are not easy and that's why everybody doesn't do it. That's why they don't even get started. But if you can get or go at it and say, right, well, we're gonna do this, but guess what? Anything that can happen will happen. So I'm going to share a few things along along that along those lines, and that is that different things that I've done. I um during the late 90s, the interest rate in the UK went up to some, something around 17 percent. Now, as most of us and some of you maybe even are watching this because you've maybe had a bad experience as a result of, of the pandemic and the COVID, and you're looking to change your career path, or, or maybe you haven't got a career anymore because it doesn't exist because of the COVID's done something to it. So 
in the 90s, when that interest rate went to 17%, it caused a similar business outcome. Obviously, people didn't die in the same way. And, and the illness and the fear factor wasn't the same, but it was the same in the sense of the impact it had on business. And so I'd ask you, you know, if you think whether you're renting somewhere or whether you've got a mortgage or a business loan, if you can imagine that tomorrow morning when you woke up, it was three times the price. So if you're paying a thousand pound for your rent today, it'd be three thousand pound tomorrow. If you had a thousand pound mortgage today, it'd be £3,000 tomorrow. And that puts an enormous pressure on your business plan or your, your goal or your desire to try and achieve something. So obviously what you're going to do, you know, you, you've either got to go bankrupt, um, you're either going to battle on and possibly run yourself into the ground if it's an impossible task, but most of us try at the very least. Uh, for me, I battled on for about seven years, I should think, in that environment. So I'm just going to throw out there some of the things that went on in that time, because a lot of these things come in cycles. And, and a rough ball of, ballpark figure to work from, and I would suggest you write this down, is that most things are normally somewhere around about a seven-year cycle. So every seven years, the interest rate might do something. Every seven years, there'd be an incident. Every seven years, property price might collapse. Every seven years... For some reason, it's seven years. I'm sure there's some scientific fact as to why. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that it's around about every seven years, there's major sort of changes and everything moves. Um, so not only did we have the 17th piece interest uh, to uh, contend with, but for me, um, I, I had a pending divorce, so there was some property to sort out, and that's how I ended up with sort of taking on extra responsibility when probably the the uh, sensible, prudish thing to do would have been to cut down my expenditure. But unfortunately, that wasn't a luxury afforded to me. So I had to, um, I had to, I had to, I had to, I'm just online doing a Zoom call. I do apologise. I'll speak to you in a minute. Sorry about that, people. Um, lesson number one, turn your phone off. Right. Um, yeah, so... I apologize. There we go. I think that's, I think that's done the task. Okay. Bear with us a second. Do apologize. Um, yeah, so what I was saying is that anything that's going to happen will happen. And for me, on and above the interest rate, there was other things. Like, for example, I was looking after a lot of homeless people and the government, the local government, um, changed the law and said that n no homeless person could stay in a bed and breakfast accommodation for longer than six weeks. So apart from we were helping homeless people, obviously most of them were on housing benefit claims, as they were called at the time now. Um, obviously, it's universal credit now, but at the time it was called housing benefit. And you could not get a housing benefit claim through in under three months. So obviously that gave knock on challenges in its own right. The first one was, is, is your cash flow going to last the three months? That's, that's one thing. The second thing, pardon me, is that as the housing market collapsed, so did the rents. So if you were getting, say, £100 a week for somebody, you were then getting £50 a week for a room. So now you've got half the money and it's taking twice as long to collect the money. And then just to make sure it wasn't too easy for you, the government went, oh, and by the way, you've only got six weeks and then they've got to move on. Now, obviously, to, to you listening to me, six weeks, really, you know, obviously there was a reason for that at the time. Um, not for me to reason why, but it was for me to have to cope with it. And I can assure you that it was very difficult. The other thing that would happen is that if somebody left, you were duty bound to acknowledge that straight away. And surprise, surprise, they would stop the money immediately. So it would take three months for them to come and the money could stop immediately. So you were in this sort of seesaw trying to balance that side of things out. Then you have the added challenge that 
there was also politics where obviously everybody, and of course, once again, talking about cycles, people are much more sort of, um, what's the right word, morally thoughtful to homeless people today than they might have been 20 odd years ago. And, and even now, to some extent, everyone's, oh, no, I've just helped the homeless people, but they wouldn't necessarily want them living next door to them. And so that possesses its problems as well, because obviously um, one of my venues was a, was a hotel down on the front at Eastbourne. And even though a lot of these buildings at the time were derelict and you, we were, you know, regulating them and, and, you know, and, and everyone knows that a building, a bit like a car, you know, if you leave a car sitting doing nothing for the winter, it's not in good shape by the following summer. And a house and a building is the same. You know, they get taken over by nature. They get taken over by squatters. They could get taken over by fire. They could, loads of things can happen. Rodents can get in, all sorts of things. So obviously, it's far better to have a building that's doing something. And in this instance, it was doing good. Um, this particular one was owned by uh, an elderly lady that was, um, get, you know, she was far from silly, but she didn't have the energy to start dealing with the sort of challenges that a modern day commercial building brings. So that's where I um, stepped in, but I'll come back to that uh, later because I did sort of touch it in the last conversation. So I'm trying to mix and match it a little bit today and come at this from a different angle and try and help you to have an idea of the sort of things that are likely to confront you that you don't see in the glossy magazines or you don't see on the funny you know, and it always makes me smile when you get the Facebook guy that comes, hi, hi, my name's Sid, and I've built a 10 million pound property portfolio. I'm going to show you how to do it. Well, I can assure you having done it, it's not as easy as that. And these things I'm sharing with you will come along. Now, what I mean by that, and remember, we've already covered quite a few things that can go wrong. Let's now look at the governments themselves. Now, I mean, England, clearly, um, by the sheer volume of people coming from war-torn countries and even over history, have all thought to travel to England because our opportunities are better. And, and I no doubt that they are better than, than other parts of the continent and Europe and the Far East. Um, but we're not perfect. We're certainly not perfect. And when I say to you that people don't want um, homeless people living next door to them, the local government that they didn't want homeless people um, living in these hotels, which when you look at what we look in the news today, I felt I'd have to shake my head. You know, there are thousands being put into these hotels every day. But for me, at that moment in time, in that part of the seven year cycle, because you've got to remember that bit, they didn't want it. So when it came on the news and they said, right, for six no longer than six weeks, they've got to move on. They should be able to find somewhere to live in six weeks and so on and so on. And, and they said, obviously, for the people that these operations that are already up and running, they're OK. But no new ones, no new ones. And then, of course, the cameras go off. And that's when the real damage starts. And I believe from my experience, whether it was me and people like me, they went, right, now get down the front of our lovely coastline and get rid of them people, close that down yesterday. So even though I had new fire doors, new fire systems and such like, this building at the time had been there about 125 years. When they came and had a check, they went, oh no, they said, no, 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 they said, you can't, you need another toilet, you need another toilet. I said, well, it's been there 125 years, you never need another toilet. Before. Yeah, no, 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 but we do insist on another toilet. Okay, I put another toilet in. Um, well, you haven't got enough staff here. It's not managed properly. The fire department come down. Time in the doors closing. So not just got to have a fire door with a fire special lock so it doesn't lock the person in, but it's got to close within a certain amount of time. It's got to have the door closures at exactly the right measure so that the fire can, all these things come into it. And if you suddenly you're already fighting a 300% increase in your servicing of your loan or your rent, and somebody comes along and says, all right, you can have, we'll have a new fire system, new fire doors, new fire locks, 
or locks, you know, multi-lock systems. New toilet. Once again, they're ramping up the pressure. And so the ability to survive becomes greater. Um, so that's just a few things if you're into buying hotels, if you're talking about letting rooms. Obviously now they call them like house of multiple occupation. That didn't really sort of exist as a HMO, as the phrase goes, um, back, back then, but they are now. Uh, now, I did touch on this on the, on the last time we done one of these chats, but I didn't chat. I, I, I was talking rather on the positive side of it, more than some of the negative things that can happen that you need to just take into consideration. Now, I thought, because I'm going to take you through my thought process and try and show that that I thought I'd covered eventualities. I really, I really did. Um, and what I mean by that is, is that whilst all this drama was going on in terms of this interest rate going up and uh, I was trying to work out how I was going to pay for everything, I had on one, one particular morning in London, because I had a building up in London with 12 people um, I was responsible for, and one of them had been um, identified uh, in an, an illegal action, which later turned out to be totally false, but obviously the police quite rightly act on the information given to them, which meant that my lovely shiny new doors that we've just talked about, my new door closures and my new... <laughs> And my new carpet and my new gloss and the nice polished. Um, they came through one morning with sledgehammers and smashed it to bits. And um, this is where another little minor detail that I said to you about earlier on is about your mental ability to deal with these things. And you do need to know when you need to just stop sometimes and take a deep breath. So for me, I... I I paid a hundred and ninety nine pound fly drive by the wonderful Richard Branson, and off I went to America for a few days to get me head straight because obviously you know to have done all that work under such circumstances and to find that it was just smashed to pieces was his heart heart soul destroying and uh so I, there I was um and and I think I'm going to throw in this is that when you come out of a pandemic like we are now or when you come out a, a recession with interest rates at the height that we had them then and you start to struggle mentally in your business life or even in your actual personal life um it's far better to do something than do nothing because if you don't do anything and you do become quite mentally ill the journey back depending on how long you stay in the sort of vacuum the longer you further down you go the longer the journey back it's not like if you say, I don't know, broke your leg, for example, you put it in a plaster and X amount of weeks later, they take the plaster off and you just have to go careful and then you'd get a stick and then, you know, hopefully in a couple of three months, you'll be brand new. If you damage your brain, that you don't have that luxury. First of all, nobody can see it. Secondly, because it's your brain, you probably don't even know you're getting to that point. And therefore, as people start to give you advice and say, listen, you're getting a bit stressed out. You need to, you need to slow down a little bit. Um, and it's for that point in time that I'm actually referring to. So for me, off I went and I booked this flight and I, and I, I upgraded my car to Pontiac convertible. Sounds very flash. I think it was about 20 quid more. And off I went with a roof down across America or Florida in this instance to just get away. Just stop. Just stop and allow yourself time to settle the best you can. Now, the only thing I would just throw in here is that if you've got a lot in, on your mind, if you're sad, or you're, there is a little bit of, you know, I do know people, I've got a, a, a relative of mine who's moved about 14 times. And I keep trying to explain to them, I say, look, just because you keep moving, you are taking your head with you, in case you hadn't noticed. So you're taking the worries with you. Moving in itself, is a, it does do offer some relief, and it might give you a little bit of a better uh, environment or whatever. But primarily, if you can't sort out your head yourself, and, and, and then move on. Unfortunately, I think I saw, I was reading the book, I think Chris Evans, once again, for people that don't know Chris Evans, Chris Evans is um, 
quite a very successful uh, presenter, media guy who uh, who owned uh, Virgin Radio and various other things. And um, he he got a bit over overzealous and uh, didn't know when to stop. And he described it as being in a Ferrari going towards a wall at 100 miles an hour with no brakes in the rain. And and I thought that was a really good it, that was a really good um, description. And um, so. Um, I'm just going to uh, just going to change something here. Just only just noticed. Bear with me a moment. Oh, I can't. Okay. So um, yeah. So where was I going with this? Yeah. So um, I um, I uh, can't remember where I was there. I've got got something distracted me. I do apologise. Yeah. So um. I was in Florida and, and my point was that I can remember going to Disney World and I was still feeling a bit cheesed off and a bit sad. So the point is just because you run away doesn't always give you the arm, doesn't always get rid of it completely. So it will do some things. And then one of those things that it did do for me was there was a little um, magazine, in-house magazine that I looked at and there was the Small Business for Franchise exhibition. And I went off and um, to visit the museum and if you go on my website, which is www.ukcomedian.com, you'll see on the pier at Eastbourne what I'm talking about. And basically, the first thing I looked at was this little vacuum um, chamber whereby you could put a balloon in it. And inside it was like a hoover. When you put the hoover on underneath, you couldn't see the hoover, you just pushed a button. It took the air out the chamber, which meant the balloon grew. And that meant you could lift the lid and obviously the air didn't come out because it had been pulled out, not blown up as you would traditionally with a balloon. And um, so that enabled you to put things in it. Bottles of champagne, fluffy toys of various shapes and sizes. And so something went in at 50 pence and turned into five pounds. So it didn't take me very long to bring that idea back to the UK. I think I was probably the second person to bring it back to England. Um, and this is where, even with the best sort of wisdom, what I'm going to demonstrate here is you can still make a huge mistake, a huge mistake. So I thought to myself, primarily because when I was a young lad, I had a little market stall down in a place called East Lane in Kensington, I'm um, sorry, Kennington which is down near the uh, famous Oval Cricket Ground and a very famous market, been there several hundred years. And so I'd learned there that trying to get a pitch in places can be very difficult. And I learned that um, by then, that obviously shops, if you were to sort of open a shop or, or take on the rent of a shop, by and large, you start getting your contractual agreements that are very, very um, sort of... Uh, it's the right word, you know, you're, you're legally tied in and you cannot, if you've picked an, op an opportunity, of, you know, a, 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 an idea, whether you've pl plucked it out of thin air or whether, whether it's something that you, you know, know that's going to work, either way, you're still locked in and you, you can have things called like, for example, a full repairing lease, which is something to watch out for. So, you know, you might get a phenomenal arrangement on a rent and a facility but find the day after you move in there, they say, well, you're responsible for it now, you sign for it. And um, by the way, you need a new roof. And you might have to spend a hundred thousand pounds on a new roof. Now, what I mean by that is, is you can't just get hold of your pal Jack down the road and say, come along and patch this roof up for me. Because in that contract, it states that you've got to use their people, not the people that you want to use. So it will be a hundred thousand pounds and you could be dead in the water before you've even started your business idea. So these are the things that I knew and I, I didn't want to have them. Um, obviously, the other thing is you think, well, I'm only selling a few balloons and surely I can sort of park myself up at the front at Eastbourne and, um, and sell some balloons. You know, I'm not troubling anybody. What could possibly go wrong? But what you would find is very quickly is that you're into a whole raft of planning regulations, licenses, um, other sort of uh, legal 
historical um, laws or convents is, a, is, a, is one word that comes up, whereby the, when the, somebody sold that land or the person that owns that land, it could be a king or, or, or you know, or, or, or queen or, you know, somebody um, could own it. And one of the things it says on there is that you can't pitch up and start selling a couple of balloons. So once again, I needed to circumvent that. I didn't want that challenge either. So I came up with the, with the idea or what I believe to be the best of the solutions. And one must remember, this is, this is a, towards the end of a recession that you've already battled hard to do. So there wasn't a lot of meat on the bone and there wasn't a lot of money to make mistakes with. So you couldn't afford to make a mistake at this point. Now, you know, there's a book just been released, I saw it advertised today by um, the uh, newspaper mogul, um, Robert Maxwell. Uh, his daughter, Ghislaine Maxwell, is in the press a lot at the moment um, in association with various parts of her lifestyle. So, but it was her father. And you've got to remember, you know, he owned newspapers, very, very multi, multi-millionaire. But, you know, he ended up he ended up jumping off a boat or was he pushed? Nobody knows. Um, so these were tough times, but there wasn't room to make a mistake. So I thought to myself, right, if you go on something like a pier, or a sort of fair ground or a, a, a controlled environment like that, you get what they call a concession. So you can buy a concession because a lot of these things are either like a winter wonderland thing where they might only be for say, I don't know, like this time of the year, it might only be for say eight weeks between sort of November and the end of January. You know, you see these ice skating places at Hampton Court and places like that where there's little units pop up around the ice rink and they've just got a little short lease, so they just sell their, you know, hot donuts or chestnuts or something of that nature for a few weeks, and then that's it. They've paid their rent and they're out. And so I thought of doing a similar thing because obviously on a, on the pier it's the other way around. Obviously it's a summer season, so it starts around about April, finishes around about October. You know what the rent is. That's what you're locked into. That's what you've got to deal with. So for me. Um, I thought that was the best option for me. And so I actually asked um, in, initially if I could go under the pier because they had some little, what you and I would describe as a garden shed, really, with a window in it. And I thought just to try this out, because remember, I've only bought something over from America. And just because you and I think is a good idea doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work. Um, so that's where that people tool bit where I started was uh, this afternoon is that you've got to follow your dream and try. But you've also got to try and have some little bit of damage limitation. So for me, at that moment of time, they wanted £4,000 for the whole summer season for the little unit underneath the pier. So what I got for that is I could get out if it didn't work. I circumvented all the planning regulations. I was able to give something a try so that at least I could go on the greater things if it did work. And I believed that that was a good, a good option. I thought I'd covered the bases by doing that. Fortunately for me, although it felt unfortunate at the time, but this is once again where you can turn sort of negatives into positives, is that they didn't build the little unit in time for the summer season to start. They got behind. However, on the pier upstairs was a prime location, a prime glass location. It was around about 15 foot square. It was a rough sort of statement. And it was empty. So I toddled down to the guy and I said, look, you know, um, summer will be over by the time you guys start. So he said, well, oh, I'm sorry, we'll get it done as quickly. I said, don't worry. I said, don't rush. I said, how about, how about if I go into that big unit on there? How's that sound? Oh, he said, yeah, good idea. Good idea. So I then turned what was effectively a negative into a positive because now it gave me an idea, an opportunity to see how much money would I take with the, um, how much money would I take in the bigger unit and the more prime location? And the answer to that question was, I took enough money to warrant upgrading to the bigger unit and taking the bigger chance. And the bigger chance was about 10,500 pounds for the season. 
but of course it was more secure in the prime location it was four times the size and so i thought it was worth the chance so i did it now although the first summer sort of seemed to come and go really quickly because obviously um we were trying to sort of play catch up a little bit and um in my case i got hold of these um they were at the time there was a, there was a lot of fashion with they had what they called athena pictures but the best way to describe them now you know there might be pictures of dogs all different kinds cats different kinds because we're a, a very um we're a very busy we're a very busy um sorry very busy we're not not busy it's not the wrong word we're very we're, we're animal lovers we're, we're a country of animal lovers and if someone sees a photograph of a dog that look, reminds them of their dog then they're, they're likely to buy it then we had dolphins and then obviously you know all sorts of pictures fancy guys with six packs then you had all the uh, take that when they were younger and all this sort of thing so we had we had about 3,000 pictures we put in this unit. So we now had the balloon machine and the pictures. So that's quite an important point because if you're new at getting into retail, then you've got to buy these products. And in order to get them at the best price, you will go through quite a strong learning curve. So for instance, we were paying one pound fifty for a fifteen by twelve picture glass in a frame in a nice display box. However, in order to get those pictures, I used to have to drive to Slough, pick them up, and drive them to Eastbourne. Now, what then happened was that obviously a very fragile, and obviously you get you know you've got a bit of wind. People sort of might knock them when they're walking by, the staff drop them. Sometimes you'd lose a few, they get damaged on the way. So you can imagine um, they had a retail value of around about $7.99, which I know one or two of you are probably thinking, wow, that's a big markup. But remember, £10,500 is a lot of rent. That's before you start with the staff. So anyway, so that's what we did. But my point about the learning curve as you're going along is you can't afford to stop looking and trying to work out how can you improve things. And one of the things that I found was I found a company. And to do that, I went to an exhibition in Birmingham and I found the same pictures, but they would deliver them. So I removed all of that work. I removed all of that expense, all that petrol wear and tear on the car, everything. And not only that. They would. If you had a breakage, they would repair it for, I think it was a pound or 150 or something like that. So once again, what a great, what a great saving, you know, it, it, the losses went down dramatically. So that, that was quite, that's quite interesting. Once again, with the fluffy toys, depending on what part of the world you go, go to the value, the, the prices are immensely different even though you might look at the product and it'll look identical, the price dip point could be literally half or even a tenth, depending where you get it from. So that's, that's quite important. Anyway, through that winter of the first winter, we sort of done all the shelves and we measured everything out absolutely precisely, uh, which was probably due to my coming from a, a retail background with a multinational uh, PLC supermarket company which incidentally they do, they measure everything. There is no mistakes in there. Um, in fact, in their instance, they actually charge people for the space on the shelf, never mind the product they're putting it on there, but we won't go down that road today. Um, so my whole essence of this, and I know I've gone on quite a while about it, is that you would imagine, would you not, that I thought about quite a lot of the things I'm in a holiday environment, you know, the balloons, children want that, the toys, the fluffy toys, people have got time to buy the pictures, we've done a buy one, buy one, buy three, get one free for the pictures, 
Um, and uh, of course, once again, that enables you to, you know, someone that wasn't even going to buy a picture, suddenly buying three, uh, so they can get the full fund for nothing. And equally, if they bought a toy, we would put it in the balloon free of charge. So once again, you've got that little bit of um, point of sales uh, to help help get that sale. And for the, the other point to bear in mind, it was quite entertaining because if anybody's seen the ship in the bottle in a, in, a, in a little shop, you know, ships in a bottle, and you think, oh, how did that get in there? So what was quite interesting is that with a little bit of chatter and a bit of music and a little bit of bravado, you almost were demonstrating how to put these toys in these balloons. And believe me, we were doing it pretty fast by the time we finished. And so we kind of had everything, I thought, ready to go for the following year. And what I mean by that is we also had what really accumulated at that stage to be about 30,000 pounds worth of stock in this unit. Now remember, it's only 15 by 15. But however, I overlooked one minor detail, <laughs> which is staringly obvious. And that was that obviously I was there waiting for the summer holidays to start and I was waiting for the, you know, the bank holiday and I knew that I'd sort of muddled through the year before. Um, and this year I was going to really crack it off. I had everything. I had the price mark right. I had the, the lighting right. I had the stock right. I had everybody trained. We had all the sign writing. You can, once again, this is all visible. You can go on the ukcomedian.com website about Adrian and stuff like that. It's all on there. And um, there I was, August Bank Holiday. You have never in your life seen weather like it. I looked to the left, which is towards Hastings, Kent, nobody, not one soul. If you look the other way, towards Brighton, Beachy Head, again, nobody, not one soul. There was an elderly lady that trotted down the pier, and that, once again, that pier had been there, it was celebrating its 125th year. And the wave had come up and gone underneath the pier and actually pushed a concrete slab up and trapped her leg under it. How about that? And I was standing there where a guy walked by with a dog, you know, obviously a local person, and a sheet of glass. Remember, this glass has been there 125 years. But the day I was there, it flew off. How it didn't chop his head off is, is a miracle to this day. And the glass just went and stuck into the wood and went wah, 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 like that. And he looked around at me and that was it. So what I've tried to do there is to try to give you as many things that you can think of, because believe me, whatever business you choose to go into and whatever you choose to do, whatever can happen will happen. Um, but of course, the flip side to that is obviously this experience that you're getting. And there isn't a shortcut. There are very few real books that are going to give you all the answers even me today trying to give you and that was quite an in-depth conversation about nothing in the grand scale of things in business terms but it shows you all the things all the checks and balances that you've got to, that you've got to watch out for um so that was that um i was talking about the uh frank sinatra earlier in the and and the, the madison square garden and I was saying to you that, um, you know, once again, a burning desire, even on that event, we had the caterers pull out last minute and we had to work around that. Um, anything that can happen will happen. And that, that if there's anything to take away from today's, you know, and I'm not being negative at all, because it didn't stop any of these things happening. It didn't stop any of the experience. It didn't stop us earning some money. It didn't stop us staying in the game. Um, I will just touch on that hotel briefly. Um, I went in more detail uh, on, on the last one of these we done, but I was the, the theme I tried I tried to pick on last time was you know how do how do you you know how do some of these people get businesses you know how do how do certain things actually materialise? So for the hotel on that occasion, because I was on the pier, and the guy in the next shop knew. I had the hotels and, and, and the properties with, uh, you know, tenants and, and homeless people and such like in them. When this elderly lady 
was talking to him and she said, oh, how are you? You know, and, and she said, oh, I don't know what to do. She said, I've got this building. I don't know. It's too much for me. And da, 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 da. And so he recommended me. So a couple of little morals there. And that is that, as a friend of mine says, it's nice to be nice. Because you just never know where the next leg up or the next sort of major contribution to your business life or even your personal life is going to come from. And one of the things that I try and share with some of people that I mentor is that it's what you don't know that hurts you. So, for instance, let's just say that I wasn't a very pleasant person. I hadn't been very helpful to the guy next door and he didn't particularly like me or whatever that is. He would be, I would think you'd all agree, quite unlikely to recommend me for this hotel. Um, but the reality is that basically I just gave her a month's rent in advance and uh, she gave me the keys and off we went, you know, at a 12 bedroom hotel. So obviously the ones in London, we had, you know, mortgages on, et cetera, et cetera, and, and so on. And, and of course, because the, if you remember this, when I started, I was saying about the rents had dropped. So I was able to get a lesser rent which went some way to trying to tr trade off to get the extra revenue to pay the ones in London that had tripled. So you can start to see the plate spinning that, 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 sort, of, that sort of goes on with some of these, with some of these things. Um, I was writing a, a tribute to a guy that I've worked with for about 28 years in the entertainment industry. And once again, this sort of, sort of stems from deciding that I wanted to be a comedian. But of course the question is, is when, 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 it, when does a comedian become a comedian? You know, when, when can you actually turn and say, I, I'm a comedian, you know? I mean, I don't even truly know the question. I suppose it would, you could argue that it's when you, when you're getting paid or maybe when you're sort of um, being sort of near enough self-sufficient on the revenue from it, I suppose would be maybe a good guide, but how do you start? Where do you start? What do you do? You know, how do you do? And, and, and once again, and I think that this is where for me, it's a question of, I thought, right, well, let's put a show on then, you know, hire some people that do know what they're doing. And then you can watch and learn from them. And then you can make a little start yourself. And if you do struggle, in this instance for me, um, you've got some other people there that can take up the slack. So obviously you've got to be a little bit proficient in selling the tickets to make sure you've got the money to pay them. And if you've got some money over to pay yourself at the end of the first one, then all well and good. But my point is that you hear about, you know, I'm sure there'll be people covering it on here today or over the next few days, the law of attraction. And I'm a great believer in that because um, here's a situation where you just don't know who's watching you. And in my case, there was a guy um, by the name of Danny Blue. And he was a comedian at that stage and an agent. And he also was a part of the uh, world famous comedy uh, trio, the, the, the Oddballs. And uh, basically they dance naked with balloons. You obviously don't see anything. That's why they go through 40 balloons in four minutes and it's funny. You think you're going to see something. So it's just a comedy thing. But you see, he saw me and, and it transpired that he was looking for somebody to come and join his team. And so even though my little event on the first one, I wouldn't put down as the most successful of events, it was successful in the sense that I got offered a role in something that went on and gave me a revenue stream for 28 years. Now. He has, um, uh, he just retired and that was what I was writing about was the journey that, that he had. Um, just to lighten this off a little bit, I'll, I'll, I'll go through some of the things that I wrote in there and some of the funny things that, that he did along the, along the way that I found very entertaining. Uh, he decided he was a part of the, what's called the Raving Looney Party. And for those that are not sure what that is, the next time there's an election, it won't be on all it won't it won't be in all all of the uh different consistencies but you'll see every now and then there'll be a raving loony party uh person that's uh, thrown their hat in the ring and he was a part of that 
uh, with a famous guy called Lord Such. And um, he, he was a famous character back in the sort of 70s, I suppose you might say. But um, so while he was running for, while he was running for uh, office, he, he, he started to lay carpet on his local high street, Wannington High Street. He, he laid carpet, you see. I mean, obviously, all the traffic was stopped for a while, and obviously, the police turned up, but obviously, so did the press. And so, when they said, What are you doing? He said, Well, he said, I'm, uh, I'm cutting down, I'm sorting out noise pollution. He said, And I'm carpeting the high street, right? <laughs> which obviously is just a load of nonsense. But the moral to the story is no publicity is bad publicity. And, and there's a classic example where it didn't really cost a lot of money. It didn't hurt anybody. Do you know what I mean? It was all done in a matter of time, you know, as long as it take, took a photograph and for someone to phone the police and get them to come and get move him on. Um, but it, it sets him aside, you know. Um, the other thing that he did, and once again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, you know, clearly this is politically incorrect in today's world, but as he put it, um, he had a, in, in the, uh, in the oddballs at that time, in the dance troupe, he had a, a little dwarf in there or a, you know a small person or um there's different names now that political correct names for them i don't know them all but anyway this guy that's called lender giant and i don't even know where it evolved from now but they bought they started something called throw a dwarf and they had a really big guy and they used to go around and it was a form of entertainment now i mean obviously it's politically incorrect now but for the guy who was on the dole the little guy that hadn't grown very much you know that had you know growing issues um he suddenly went from being, you know, unemployed on the dole to famous, earning a lot of money. So obviously you've got the people that even to this day, you know, would, wouldn't agree with it. it, it it's publicity, you know. Um, I was talking to somebody last night. They were talking about promoting their book or promoting their thing. You know, this thing about publicity and PR, you know, if, if you're not careful, you could spend an absolute fortune promoting your business whatever it is whereas in actual fact if you're a little bit cheeky and you know you're prepared to stick your head above the parapet and be a little bit naughty uh no i'm not saying doing the illegal particularly but obviously if you take the balloon dancers you know if you've got a i can remember there was a club in ipswich comes to mind and um i can't think of the guy's name now but anyway lovely guy he will be turned up. Oh, he said, we sold out tonight. He said, sold out tonight. We went, sold out? He said, yeah, you got full house. He said, full house. So we were laughing with him, you know, and we went, well done. Oh, what was his name? Colonel. He came to me then. Kerpel or something. Anyway, he said, yeah. He said, I rung the council and complained about myself. <laughs> so he, he'd rung up and complained that these three naughty men were coming with balloons, dancing naked. And he, he obviously pretended to be some member of the public or whatever. And of course, once again, it stimulated, it stimu it stimulated, um, it stimulated uh, interest, and of course, got on the front page of the newspaper that that you know that these these naughty men were coming down to do this um, comedy dance and everything else. Now, I mean, the reality is that we've done every national television station. You know, we've done a Des O'Connor show, Taggart. Um, before I joined, they just done uh, EastEnders. You know, which obviously is seven o'clock. Um, I've had discussions with Britain's Got Talent about three years running for us to go on there. Um, you know, we chose not to go on there, but you know, what I'm trying to say is it's not for anybody watching this, it's not that naughty. Do you know what I mean? If we can go out at 7 30 on a Saturday night on the Britain's Got Talent or the East Enders, it's it's a joke. Do you know what I mean? You don't, it's not, it's not a sexual thing, it's, it's a joke, um, and it's a funny thing. But my point is, is it is an example of where you can get publicity for your whatever it is that you're doing. You know, um, I, uh, I once again uh, another part of the conversation last night. There was a gentleman that worked in the uh, NHS that, in his opinion, for reasons best known to himself, decided that uh, he'd rather not be vaccinated, and therefore he has obviously been sacked from his job. Um, so what is he to do? And one of the things that he had a girlfriend that sadly passed away. Um, she was very poorly from, uh, she had uh, drug related issues, 
substance abuse. And she sadly died. So he wrote a book about it. And, and the conversation we were having was how, how was he going to promote his book? And uh, we were in Brighton at the time. And I just made it up off the top of my head. I said, well, your best bet, obviously you're not happy that you, you know, you've had to leave your career because of not wanting something in your body, which some years ago would have been unheard of, but it, it's not now. Um, you know, it's not for me to pontificate on it. I'm just saying that that was his, where he found himself. And I said to him, I said, your best bet is to go and uh, strip all your clothes off, run in the big wheel at the front of Brighton, refuse to come down. I said, and everybody will turn up. All the press will turn up, the police will turn up and everything. I said, and when they interview you, um, they're more likely going to say to you, well, what are you going to do now? And then you can say, well, I've got my book. Um, which is no different to when you watch Graham Norton on a Friday night and all those people are on there promoting a movie, promoting a film, promoting this, promoting that and they make a television program out of it. So that's just talking a little bit about, you know, publicity in that respect. Um, we've done something similar with, I don't know if you can all remember, that there was a, a, a film out um, called The Full Monty in the uh, early 90s, which was very successful. It was probably one of the most successful uh, British exports of the year. And it told the story of... Um, a load of guys that are following on hard times in this recession that I'm referring to in the steel industry in Sheffield. And they all started to, um, you know, get together because they were trying to get a few quid together to survive. And, um, and in a way, that's how I came in the entertainment industry, because obviously I had 25 homeless people looking at me saying, it's going to be all right. And it? it's going to be all right. And I said, well, yeah, of course it is. Of course it is not really knowing how I was going to find another thousand pound a month when as we just discussed, this interest rate was doubling and doubling and doubling. So um, people often say to me, well, how do you do something like that back in the day? Well, you know, I think those properties are somewhere in the region of several millions now, they're about three million, something like that. So my question to you is, and this is for those people thinking of having a business and when you lock, get yourself locked into these contracts, uh, financial agreements and such like, if you're going to do them, um, how prepared are you to do whatever it takes? Now, for me at that time, it was there's 25 homeless people going to be homeless if I fail. Uh, I had three young children. You know, I, I had, I had a, a wife that needed to have some financial contribution to look after the three children. So... I didn't feel I had much options. And so when I stumbled across quite by accident, I hasten to add somebody, uh, you know, starting to become a part of the full Monty kind of world, it was quite easy for me. Do you, you know, and so I ask you, if you had to house your children, if you had to keep the roof over your head, if you had to save 25 homeless pe people um, and, uh, and not lose three million pounds, how long would it take you to decide to do something like, in my case, the full Monty or the balloon dance or something of that nature at that moment in time? Because fear is quite a motivator. And, um, you know, and you see it even in today's world where people get desperate. They do they do crazy things. But obviously what I was doing wasn't wasn't illegal. It was just a sort of extension of entertainment, really, and goes on to this day. So. The whole thing we've talked about today is, is, you know, whatever's going to happen will happen. Are you prepared to do whatever it takes? You know, it is no good you saying, oh, well, I'm going to have this, I'm going to have that. Um, I remember one occasion where we moved off the pier, obviously in the winter months, and we went into one of these sort of uh, indoor marketing type of places, and it went into liquidation. Absolutely nothing to do with me whatsoever. But I'd had my tonsils out. And of course, if you have your tonsils out as an older person, it, it's quite a serious uh, operation by all accounts. Not that I treated it that way, or, or well, I, I had to. But um, and when I got the phone call to say, "Well, you know, they're going to go and pay, take it away," or come in to lock the door, and um, you won't be able to get all your stock out. I can assure you, I was down that warehouse in about half an hour. But of course, I shouldn't have been because I got dust and all this stuff, and I should have been resting, and then, and then I hemorrhaged. So. Not ideal, but it's an insight to some of the things that go on with some of these people. And um, 
and I, you know, let's talk about a few books of people that have done these journeys. You know, if you if you look at, um, you know, books that I would recommend, um, uh, Donald Trump's The Art of the Deal was probably one of the first ones that I that I, uh, that I ever read, which which has got some fantastic things in it. I think the thing that I took from that book is that once again, when you're deciding what business you're going to do, something that we haven't touched on is is the risk factor, and is there any way that you can lessen that risk? And I think a brilliant thing in that book is the way that Donald Trump heard on the radio one day that the Holiday Inn shares had gone down because of a strike in two casinos. And he thought to himself, he thought, well, surely, you know, Holiday Inn's a worldwide business. Surely a little strike in two casinos is not going to have that effect. But what it materialised is that 60% of Holiday Inn's profits come out of those two casinos. And it didn't take Donald Trump long to realise that he was in the wrong business. So he set about it. Now, on the other camp was Comrade Hilton, who was building one of the biggest casinos in Nevada in the desert at the time. And he, a bit like me with the weather, a bit like me with them changing the law, he done this most spectacular development you'd ever did see. And he overlooked the fact, he took for granted that he was going to get a license to operate the casino. And the authorities that took a dislike to him and said, no, you can't have a license. And there he was, all his money overstretched in a serious position and had to sell. Donald Trump, on the other hand, couldn't afford no more than Hilton could, no for more than Holiday Inn could. But he went to Holiday Inn and he went, look, I'll tell you what, how about we go 50-50? And you know how to get the casino license. They've already given you several. So you'll get another one. So he lessened his risk. And, and, the, and the moral to that story is it's better to get 50% of a lot than 100% of nothing. And that is so important to get into your head when you're starting out and deciding where your responsibilities are versus your risk versus the point that I've made, which is down here, anything that will happen, can happen. Anything that can happen, will happen. And you need to have a bit of meat on the bone to protect yourself. So if you haven't worked out how you're gonna survive things like that, this is another good way of doing it. If you've got someone else that you can lean against a little bit or that they can help or, you know, things like that. So, so that's, that's the example of um, Donald Trump. Uh, once again, Richard Branson's book. I think he might have wrote several. So I would imagine I'm talking about the first one. And he talks in there about when he got his very first aeroplane. Now, he obviously built everybody in the plane and you know, all the media people in the plane and everything. And he took them all for a ride in his new aeroplane get the publicity but you know unfortunately one of the engines blew up so once again anything that can happen will happen now in that instance the press were fairly kind to him apparently and he does say that in the book but he had another instance where as things moved on they started to have televisions in the plane so he wanted to have televisions or screens, which are now pretty standard, but back then they weren't. So he went and said, can I have some money? I need to put screens in the aeroplane. And the banker said, no, no, you can't. You're overstretched. You're not allowed to have, you can't afford to put them in there. We talk about it. it's only television screens. Surely it won't be. Yeah. No, no, can't have them. So there's an interesting little twist, a little bit like Donald Trump went for the 50 50 option. Sometimes when you get told, no, you can't do it because. Sometimes you've just got to step back and look at it and find another way around it. And in this instance, and this is the weirdness of business life, it's the weirdness of gearing of money, it's the, it's the weirdness of, of the banking system, of credit, um, of perception. And that is, they said, well, no, you can't have a television. Well, he was persistent. 
And in the end, one of the bank managers went, look, right, he goes, you can't have, you can't have new televisions. You've got no money, so you can't have them. He said, I'll tell you what you can have. He said, you could have new aeroplanes. You know what? He said, what do you mean? Oh, yeah, so we can give you new aeroplanes, you see, because we set the loan against the aeroplane. But if you just want to put television screens in, he said, then, uh, you know, that's just like a little lost... You know, that's money you've spent. Is it doesn't doesn't come that, that doesn't put us in that. Thing. And right there is our Richard Branson now has the best aeroplanes with the best facilities, and 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 Virgin has gone on to such strength. And that's a simple little thing. So once again, I put that to you that you may have, you know, you might have um. You might have a situation where you you know you've opened a taxi company or something, and you might want to upgrade your taxes or put some new some sort of new navigation equipment in or something of similar consequence that's going to cost quite a lot of money when in fact you could probably just swap the cars over probably even get a tax relief in the, in the process of doing it or go from say owning your vehicles to leasing them and and you've got you're now up to date with the top dollar product in order to move forward without spending a penny i don't know what time i've got left so i'm going to quickly um, run over this one because we touched on this last time and it's quite important it's a friend of mine wanted to buy a bar and he didn't have any money and he came to me and once again he was in this very difficult time so we went to see this bar and uh this is the short version he um we went in there we looked all around it it was an awful grotty horrible looking place but apparently it took a thousand pound on the door and so when we got back to the meeting with the guy i said to him well look i said you know um you know, he said, well, do you want it or not? And then we went, well, you know, those beer sales, he said he sold £4,000. I said, is that definitely 4000 He said, yes. I said, right. And that £1,000, I said, that definitely exists on the door. He said, yes. I said, I take it there's no audit trail. He said, no. I said, well, right. I said, about that guy over there that I bought to the party? I said, is he a good publican? She basically said, yeah, I think so. So I said, right, okay. So he's the man for the job. So he said, yes. So I said, right. I said, so this is what we'll do. He wanted £80,000 for this club. And I noticed it was a free house. So I said, we'll tie it to a brewery. That'll give you the first £60,000. I said, are you sure about this £1,000? He said, yes. I said, good. You keep it for another 20 weeks. And that'll be the other 20000 we owe you. And he went, yes. And with that, we walked away with the keys of a nightclub. Ta -da! Um, so... What I've shared with you this afternoon is a couple of examples where you, you get a hotel and you don't part with a penny really, and a nightclub and you haven't parted with a penny really. Um, I will put a carif, carif, carif on the um, on the club. It did have a full repairing lease and the roof was bad, so we didn't take it in the end. But the principle is there for you to go and use. You, you know, if you wanted to take away a tool. It would be that. Um, so anyway, I'm coming up to four o'clock. If my man's listening, wants to give me some indication whether I'm carrying on or or, or not, please do so. Um, I don't know. I don't even know if we're doing any questions and answers, are we? Are we just recording this? What are we doing? Somebody from Digilate. Expo, give me some advice. What you want me to do? <laughs> what do you want me to do, sir? Carry on or stop? Or uh, what? You, Please. Uh, it's already four, but uh, do you still want to carry on? Well, yeah, but I'm happy because we started late, but I didn't want to be rude and go, and I didn't want, I just wanted to <laughs> let you know whatever it was. So <laughs> you can I'm carry on now for it. This is a question. <laughs> But for now, uh, we're, we don't have any questions for you or the viewers. Right. Okay, yeah. that's cool. So we'll call it a day then, shall we? I yeah, so. okay. We'll call it a day, I reckon. All right. So sorry for the late start if anybody was waiting. Um, no worries. Sometimes it's okay. these things get viewed more as over time, over mm. time. But anyway, it's been great. From me, Adrian Doughty, ukcomedian.com. And uh, thank you, Digital Media, for uh, having me on this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, too, for taking your time out of your uh, schedule. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. And see you again for uh, our Bye. future expos. Bye.
Thank you, sir.